Can I pray for you all? Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here um, and to be surrounded by these remarkable paintings. Uh, I've known uh, these images for, for quite some years. This is actually the first time I've uh, seen the uh, actual paintings. Uh, and it's uh, quite wonderful to, to look at these uh, phenomenal, uh, if uh, depressing, uh, images. Um, so I'm going to talk not just about political prisoners. I'm going to talk about the Gulag uh, in general. Uh, and I hope it'll be a way to sort of contextualize our uh, discussion today. So uh, my book that's coming out, uh, as Christian mentioned, Death and Redemption, The Gulag and the Shaping of Soviet Society, uh, it's slated to be published in May. Um, I've spent actually over a quarter of my life studying, thinking, talking, and writing about the Gulag. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is share with you a few of my conclusions uh, about what exactly the Gulag was, uh, and what role it played in the Soviet Union, especially in the Stalin years. Uh, my book itself offers a history of the Gulag largely uh, by means of a, uh, a study in uh, Karaganda, the, a region in Kazakhstan. I'll point to you real quick. Uh, this is an area that housed one of the largest, uh, the longest lasting uh, Gulag camps uh, in the Stalinist system. Uh, it held a substantial population in this region of internally exiled peoples. Uh, it hosted four of a very small number of special camps that were created in 1948. This is the, the type of camp that uh, Solzhenitsyn describes in uh, Ivan Denisovich. Uh, and it experienced one of the three major Gulag uprisings that occurred in the wake of Stalin's death. Uh, that is to say, by going to Karaganda, I spent uh, several months there working through uh, the local uh, archive of this camp system. Uh, I was able to look at most of the major events and institutions of Gulag history uh, at the ground level. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, you know, give you some of my conclusions from uh, that work. Now, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his magisterial Gulag Archipelago, relates the tale of a prisoner ship uh, that's headed for the Dalstroy gold fields of the notorious Kalima. Uh, Kalima, I should mention, is in the popular imagination sort of the Auschwitz of the Gulag. Uh, you'll see uh, the city of Magadan out in the far east. Uh, this is the Kalima River uh, and camps along that area. Um, it was located in the extreme northeast of the Soviet Union and was reputedly one of the coldest inhabited places on the planet. Uh, prisoners like to describe Kalima uh, as a place where 12 months are winter uh, and all the other months are summer. So as this ship caravan approached Magadan, the ships became stuck in the icy waters of the Kalima River. Uh, the prisoners were forced to disembark and walk across the frozen river to the shore and then onto their camp. And Solzhenitsyn writes about this. He says, nonetheless, continuing to play out the farce of correction, in other words, pretending they had brought not simply bones with which to pave the gold-bearing Kalima, uh, but temporarily isolated Soviet citizens who would yet return to creative life they were greeted by the Dahlstory Orchestra. The orchestra played marches and waltzes. Now what could possibly seem more out of place than an orchestra greeting the arrival of a prisoner caravan into the depths of the Gulag? Uh, this paradox that Solzhenitsyn raises uh, brings us to an important set of questions about the Gulag. Uh, because in the Gulag, forced labor, high death rates, and an oppressive atmosphere of violence, cold, and constant hunger uh, coexisted with camp newspapers and cultural activities, uh, a constant propaganda barrage about things like correction and re-education, uh, and importantly, the steady release of a significant portion of the Gulag prisoner population. Now, Solzhenitsyn copes with the contradiction here by relegating correction to the category of farce. That is to say, it's one more sadistic, uh, cruel joke perpetrated by an unjust, immoral, and atheistic regime. But I think we do have to ask ourselves why the Soviet authorities went to such tremendous lengths to maintain this farce of correction. Why are these new arrivals to the depths of Siberia greeted not by a show of force, but by an orchestra playing marches and waltzes? 
Uh, and why is it that corrective practices uh, endure in the camps from a prisoner's arrival until his departure, whether that departure is dead or alive? Now, the Soviet state certainly had the know-how, it had the experience, it had the facilities, uh, and it was certainly willing to use violence, uh, such that they could have exterminated every one of the millions who passed through the Gulag. Uh, yet what we'll discover, interestingly, is that they chose not to create a truly genocidal institution. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, then, is the history of an institution that became, in many ways, a symbol of the Soviet Union, and I would say rightly so. Uh, that is the Gulag, the Soviet Union's vast system of forced labor concentration camps and internal exile. So what exactly was the Gulag? Uh, well, the term Gulag, of course, is a, a, an acronym from the Russian for the chief administration of camps. And thus it actually refers to a particular bureaucratic institution charged with oversight of the Soviet camp system. But I use the term more broadly, as most of us do. Uh, following Solzhenitsyn, uh, to refer to the entire Soviet forced labor detention system. Uh, so the Gulag included a variety of different kinds of institutions, but I think we can boil them down essentially to three types, which is to say prisons, uh, concentration camps, and internal exile. Now prisons, you know, we know what they are. Uh, but in the Gulag, prisons serve primarily as a place of detention for people while they're under investigation, while they're going through interrogation, uh, as seen prior to the pronouncement of an actual sentence. Only a very small portion of Gulag inmates would actually serve their sentence in prisons. Now, the Gulag included several different types of concentration camps. Uh, and this was the primary place of detention for all those who had been individually convicted of one or another alleged crime. Uh, now, you can see here on this map uh, the location, uh, the best we know, of uh, Gulag camps uh, in the Stalin era. Um, so if you see the city of Perm uh, just off of Moscow, that's the Ural Mountains uh, right through there. Uh, so it looks a bit like the Gulag actually primarily exists in uh, the European part of the Soviet Union. Uh, if we look at a slightly different map uh, from a new project mapping uh, the distribution of prisoners, uh, we'll see that the largest camps uh, were actually in the geographical, geographical extremes, so the far north, uh, the far uh, east, uh, and Soviet Central Asia. Now, for prisoners, arrival in a concentration camp actually meant that they had passed the first major barrier to survival, which is to say they had not been executed, and we should never lose sight of the fact that many, many were. Concentration camps offered relatively free movement within a camp zone, most typically surrounded by a fence or barbed wire and containing a number of overcrowded, poorly heated barracks. Most of a prisoner's waking hours, however, were not spent in the camp zone, but they were spent under armed guard at various types of forced labor. Uh, and there was a great variety in the type of work performed. Uh, there was a great variety uh, in the level of oppressiveness of their living conditions in the Gulag. Not all camps are exactly the same. Uh, but between the extreme conditions, uh, the brutality dished out by sometimes sadist guards, uh, and the violence that was rampant among the prisoners themselves, a Soviet concentration camp would certainly put the worst of American prisons to shame in terms of the sheer wretchedness of living conditions. Uh, and we consider here just for a moment the description offered by Alexander Dahoun, uh, an American Gulag prisoner, written an absolutely uh, phenomenal memoir. Uh, uh, and he's describing his arrival to a Gulag camp in Kazakhstan in 1950. Uh, and he writes, we were unloaded beside a huge stone wall. Almost immediately after the sun appeared, there was some noise from inside the gates, and in a moment they swung open. A thin, tired horse appeared, drawing a flat farm wagon with wooden wheels. Ten or twelve corpses were stretched out on the wagon. Somehow I found this normal. I was watching indifferently until the wagon stopped and two guards appeared with axes. Then I felt quite sick. The guards methodically walked from corpse to corpse and swung the axes up and down. I began to feel as though I was hallucinating again because I could hear a band playing some kind of bravura march. I had a deep sense of cosmic horror that made me dizzy. In the distance, I could see the silhouette of the corpses on the wagon. Then it got worse. Out of the gate came, in lines of five abreast, a column of walking corpses in black jackets with white number patches. Now finally, we have to keep in mind the system of internal exile. 
Um, this is something that was used mostly for large groups of people uh, who were condemned not for particular crimes, but for membership in a suspect group, sometimes defined by class, uh, and sometimes including entire ethnic groups. Um, and I, I bring this map, and I realize it's in Russian, so you, you may not be able to read it. Uh, but the important thing about this map uh, is that the shaded areas show you areas that had a high concentration of internally exiled peoples. Uh, so you'll see once again that we're talking about the far north, uh, we're talking about Central Asia and Siberia, uh, where these uh, people were located. <laughs> Exiles uh, were required to live within a fixed region, uh, and they had to report periodically to the local secret police. Uh, and leaving the region of exile without permission was treated as a crime, treated as escape, and it was subject to very stiff penalties. Um, so the Gulag then served actually as the Soviet penal system. Uh, on the one hand, many of its prisoners were like prisoners in any country. Uh, the Gulag held the Soviet Union's robbers, its rapists, its murderers, and its thieves. Uh, but the Gulag, of course, was more than that. Concentration camps held political prisoners. Uh, it's a group that included not only real opponents of the Soviet regime, uh, but could also include those only thought to be potential opponents, uh, or even fully loyal Soviet citizens who were caught up merely for telling a joke about Stalin, uh, or maybe for accidentally spilling a cup of coffee on a newspaper portrait of Stalin and then being denounced by a neighbor. So it's anybody who committed anything that could even be conceivably understood as a political crime. But the Gulag was also filled, uh, and its largest group, with millions of other victims of very arbitrary and draconian legal campaigns. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Under one law, a hungry peasant who took a few potatoes from a field in a time of famine could be given 10 years in the concentration camps. Under another, a worker who arrived late to work on multiple occasions could be given five years for what they called shirking the duty to work. All of these various victims of the Gulag are tied together merely that in, they, in some way they were determined to be unfit for or dangerous to Soviet society. The Gulag was a mass social institution. Now before the opening of the archives in the late Soviet and the post-Soviet era, uh, Solzhenitsyn and Robert Conquest and others speculated that the Gulag's population was in the tens of millions. Uh, we do know now with some degree of accuracy that the total population of prisons, camps, and exile reached a maximum in the early 1950s of some five, five and a half million people. Throughout its history, though, some 18 million people would pass through the prisons and camps of the Gulag. Um, and another, perhaps six or seven million, were subject to internal exile. Now, these numbers are smaller than what we once thought, but they still talk about a massive institution that touched all parts of Soviet society. Uh, if you weren't there yourself, you certainly knew somebody who was. The Gulag was also a system of forced labor. All able-bodied inmates, uh, and many who weren't really so able, uh, were required to work. And this massive system was an active participant in the Soviet economy and in the opening of new and remote regions to economic exploitation. Uh, so in the very harsh climatic conditions of uh, the Gulag, prisoners uh, felt timber. Uh, they carried out vast construction projects of, of cities, railroads, canals, highways. Um, they uh, they uh, operated vast agricultural enterprises. Uh, they mined gold copper and coal. But foremost, though, I think if we're going to understand the Gulag, we have to understand that it was an integral part of a radical attempt to construct a new socialist society. The Bolsheviks, the communists, immediately set out to overturn all aspects of the Tsarist system. But perhaps paradoxically, they often did this with the tools of that system. The Soviet Union had inherited a system of exile of political opponents directly from the Tsarist state. But the Tsarist system of exile and forced labor differed in a number of key ways. First, of course, was the sheer quantitative matter. Uh, the Tsar's aspirations of controlling their society were much more limited than their communist counterparts. During the drive to collectivize agriculture in the late 1920s, early 1930s, Soviet authorities would exile more people in just a few years than the Tsarist state did in the entire 19th century. Now, this 
quantitative issue is of qualitative importance because Soviet authorities from the time of the October 1917 revolution had a grand idea about creating a new socialist society and what they called the new Soviet person. If we were to oversimplify a bit, we could say that the Soviet state understood itself as governing, controlling people, while the imperial state had governed and controlled land. Once a person had been sent into czarist exile, the state actually cared relatively little about what they did, uh, what they thought, uh, or whether or not they were being quote-unquote rehabilitated. Uh, czarist exile was for punishment, and it was for removing dangerous persons uh, from the centers of power. For the Soviet state, on the other hand, there was no safe space for prisoners. There were no sidelines uh, in this revolution. Uh, they were intensely interested in complete control over the imprisoned and exiled populations, so much so that they operate very large systems of uh, informants and internal surveillance and <coughs> what they call the political moods of the prisoners. Uh, and there was this large cultural and educational apparatus that was aimed at transforming those political moods. So Lenin had commented as early as 1918 on the need to make use of concentration camps in the battle with the enemies of the revolution. Uh, but the origins of the Gulag as such a massive social system uh, are not found just in that czarist exile system. And they're not found just in these first concentration camps. Uh, and they're not found just in the battle with the revolution's enemies. Uh, we have to pay attention to Bolshevik visions, communist visions, the way they understood the world, visions of creating a perfect society, visions of struggle as the motive force of history, visions of enemies blocking the path to and contaminating that utopia they were supposedly creating, visions of labor as the defining feature of humanity, and visions of criminality as something created by social conditions. All these elements of the Bolshevik worldview combine with particular historical circumstances to make the creation and the mass expansion of the Gulag possible. Now, the real explosion of the Gulag population awaited the late 1920s and the beginning of Stalin's so-called revolution from above. That is to say, the attempt to build a socialist society through rapid industrialization, forced collectivization of agriculture, the radical transformation of an entire people's culture, and the destruction of all those who stood in the way of building that perfect future. And make no mistake, that destruction was often quite lethal. According to figures gathered since the fall of the Soviet Union from 1921 to 1953, some 800,000 people were sentenced to death by Soviet secret police organs alone. Uh, and this is no doubt a minimum number. Uh, furthermore, at least 1.6 million died in Soviet concentration camps. We don't have reliable figures for deaths among exiles, uh, but they're certainly in the millions. Uh, and all of this, of course, doesn't even consider the millions killed in civil war and killed in famine. Nonetheless, despite the frequently high rates of mortality, and in the worst years, according to official statistics, which are quite probably too low, uh, mortality rates in the camps approach 25% of the prisoner population per year. Uh, now, this is in the worst years. Uh, and despite the fact that literally millions died in the gulag, the system uh, was never quite one of factories of death. Death, as I'm going to demonstrate to you, was in the eyes of Gulag authorities an accepted and even an expected outcome for many Gulag prisoners. Uh, but the practices of the Gulag were not designed for a sort of routinized, industrialized death. The door of the Gulag was, in fact, a revolving one. Perhaps the most important archival finding for our understanding of the system in the years since the fall of the Soviet Union was the revelation that during the period of 1934 to 1953, we saw in any given year the release of somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the Gulag population. Uh, no year in that period saw the release of fewer than 115,000 inmates, uh, and the number who were released could reach a half a million or more. Now, we, we have to try to understand this, this coexistence of mass death uh, and mass release. When the Bolsheviks came to power, they sought a thoroughly revolutionary transformation of the peoples of the Russian Empire. And in this way, they were part of a quintessentially modern political ethos. Uh, it had its roots in the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, and it saw society as a subject to be transformed. The politics of social engineering uh, and the role of penal politics in that social engineering process 
uh, was by no means an exclusively Bolshevik or communist phenomenon, uh, but they did bring to this transformative vision their own particularities. The 18th and 19th centuries saw prominent penal reforms throughout the Euro-American world, uh, designed to replace corporal punishment and incarceration as punishment uh, with imprisonment as a method of re-education. Criminals came to be understood as a social disease that had to be transformed in order to make the social body healthy. Uh, penal politics began to focus less on controlling the prisoner body and more on transforming the prisoner's soul. And the Bolsheviks certainly subscribed to such notions of criminality if they believed they were creating something fundamentally new, uh, that they were overcoming what they called the cult of the prison, uh, in favor of the use of communal life uh, and corrective labor to rehabilitate what they understood as the wayward proletarian. Uh, now, the Bolshevik worldview could not envision social transformation through mere legislative action. Re-education would not occur in a classroom. Uh, it would occur in a mine, uh, or in a field, or on a construction site. Purification of the individual required that he first be broken in order to be rebuilt. Furthermore, not everyone could be rehabilitated, and those implacable enemies who refused rehabilitation, and this is the way they understood it, they refused rehabilitation, were deemed a danger to the revolutionary creation of utopia, and they had to be destroyed. Not humanitarians we're talking about. The gulags served both as a tool to reform those who could be reformed, but also as a place to define who could and who could not be reformed. The gulag was an imprecise, crude tool for the transformation of society. In the gulag, society's filth, and this is the kind of language that we use, society's filth, subjected to the harshest conditions, would either be purified and therefore return to society, or they would be cast out fully and finally through death. If an arrested person escaped execution and survived long enough to enter the gates of the gulag, all were potentially redeemable. But it should be emphasized redemption was never guaranteed. In the Soviet worldview, the coexistence of violence and transformation, of creation and destruction, was not a contradiction. In fact, one was unimaginable without the other. As Stalin's prosecutor Vyshinsky himself once said, he said, all Soviet penal policy is based on a combination of repression and compulsion with persuasion and re-education. The two-in-one task is suppression plus re-education of anyone who can be re-educated. Now, to understand the gulag, we should focus not only on re-education, and we will, and we'll talk about that a bit, but also on the last portion of that statement, anyone who can be re-educated, and particularly its implication that not everyone could be. Soviet penal policy did not treat prisoners in an undifferentiated manner. Uh, in accord with the common practice of nearly all modern states aiming to understand and therefore control and transform their societies, the Soviet state engaged uh, in a practice of almost endless categorization of its citizens. Uh, in the Soviet case, individuals were identified in relation to their perceived political reliability. That is to say, their qualifications for inclusion in the Soviet society. In the Gulag, an elaborate and ever-shifting hierarchy of identities emerged from this incessant categorization. Uh, not only were prisoners defined, of course, in opposition to camp authority, but these are the prisoners and these are the guards, uh, but they were themselves divided at different times by their class background, uh, by their ethnic origin, uh, by the crime that they had allegedly committed, and this is you know, an area that plays a significant role in terms of whether you're a political prisoner or not, uh, by uh, your military status, whether you had served in the Red Army, by your gender. Now, all of these, of course, to say things that, that a prisoner was prior to their arrival at camps. Uh, but they were also categorized according to their labor productivity in the camps, uh, their behavior in the camps, their state of their health. That is to say, who they had become while in the camps. Now, all of these categories bore a direct relationship to the perceived redeemability or the perceived danger of uh, the prisoner or exile person, and consequently it also uh, bore a direct relationship to the chances of survival. Now to make all this clearer and more concrete, I want to end by spending a couple of minutes talking about corrective labor itself uh, and its relationship to the coexistence of re-education and violence in the Gulag. In Bolshevik thought, in Marxist thought, actually, labor meant more than just that economic output. It was the defining characteristic of humanity. Uh, and in penal politics, it was the ultimate tool for the return of the prisoner to society. Um, corrective labor was among the very first innovations in Soviet penal practice, and it was perhaps the defining feature of the Soviet gulag. 
Now this compound term, which they always use, corrective labor, uh, must be understood with reference to both parts of the term. Uh, the intensely ideological corrective aspects of this Soviet practice are often eradicated in historical considerations of the Gulag in favor of an understanding of forced labor as exclusively a practice of deriving economic benefit from slave labor. In fact, one of the more important conclusions of recent scholarship on the Gulag, and this is not my own scholarship, uh, has been to put to rest once and for all the illusion that forced labor was free or even that it was cheap. Um, forced labor was ineffective, it was almost exclusively physical and unqualified labor, uh, and its productivity remained low. Although Gulag authorities attempted almost perpetually to improve the productivity of the Gulag. Um, the Gulag as an economically profitable institution was always undercut by the Gulag as a highly secretive detention institution for those considered dangerous to Soviet society. The Gulag, in fact, we know now was a financial catastrophe for the Soviet state. Uh, but it survived because it was not primarily about profitability. The Gulag was a penal institution first and a productive institution second. Uh, the Gulag's role in the battle with class enemies and the enemies of the people uh, was far more important to Soviet authorities than its profitability. Uh, so in all of the efforts of Gulag bureaucrats to increase productivity and decrease costs, and they didn't work on this kind of thing, uh, there was one cost-cutting tactic that was never even considered. And that is to say, the reduction of the size of the militarized guards, those guards in the camps. Uh, in fact, the militarized guard as a percentage of the detained population grew significantly throughout the history of, of, of the camp system. Uh, so we see that the population of the Gulag explodes, but in fact, the uh, number of guards is rising at a faster rate. And you have to ask yourself, how necessary was all of this guard, uh, or the extensive system of internal camp surveillance for that matter, uh, in the extreme environments of Siberia. These outposts of the Gulag were in such extreme locations, both geographically and climatically, that escape was exceedingly unlikely. If a prisoner escaped, where was he to go? How was he to survive? But back to the point, corrective labor in the Soviet Union involved a great deal more than just economic output. Bolshevik penal policy viewed labor as the key to reforging the prisoner and making him or her fit for a place in the new Soviet society. Uh, and it was also treated as a measuring stick of that so-called rehabilitation. Now, labor and death and correction, they all coexist quite easily in the Gulag. The Soviet effort to transform humanity was for them fundamentally and unproblematically a violent one. Uh, and to mention just briefly, one of the ways in which all of these elements of the Gulag were tied together, my book talks a lot about um, these various practices. Uh, but we should think about the tie of prisoner food rations to labor productivity. Food rations were assigned according to your completion of work quotas. Um, now, while this system certainly serves to motivate prisoners to increase labor output, it also functions within the system by tying the measure of re-education to the fulfillment of work norms. Um, it was never thought that prisoners couldn't fulfill norms, but that they refused to do so. Uh, so failure to fulfill norms was treated as a failed commitment to redemption uh, and a continuation of one's evil activities. Um, the unredeemed were unworthy of returning to society. So reduced rations would either compel improved labor performance by breaking down a prisoner's resistance and therefore lead to the prisoner's so-called re-education, uh, or if the prisoner continued to resist this so-called re-education uh, by failing to fulfill norms, his rations would ultimately lead to starvation and death, removing him from the social body once and for all. Uh, and this is, of course, what often happened. Uh, even if a prisoner produced 100% of their daily quota, uh, their body would break down, uh, and they wouldn't be able to produce it tomorrow, and so they produce 90% and they get less food, which, of course, leads them on this cycle uh, to death. Now, I have to show you this image to finish. Um, one of the most uh, interesting photos that I found in the course of my research on visual presentation of the blood, uh, and it's, it's a propaganda graveyard in the middle of a camp zone, uh, and it's called the Graves of, Graves of the Lazy, it's a uh, Filon. Uh, Filon of, uh, is a Russian acronym, a sort of gulag term for uh, the false invalids of camps of special designation. Uh, and what you'll see here is in this graveyard, all of the grave markers are marked with percentages. 
Mavlan of 22%, Gazia of 30%, Razorni of 42%. And what this is clearly telling prisoners is if you do not perform your labor quota, you will wind up in the grave. They had no problem with this. They weren't embarrassed about it. Um, they openly advertised it. Uh, and so we see the way in which all of these things uh, are tied together. Soviet authorities always operated on the assumption that it was better that too many die than not enough. The Gulag was always a place of mass death. It was a place of mass release. And to understand that, uh, I think we always have to keep those two aspects in mind. Thanks.